Well, when Joseph Smith reviewed the Bible and revised it, he thought it meant that, but he didn't believe that, so he changed it. It becomes verse 23. Smith changed it to read, No man knoweth that the Son is the Father, and that the Father is the Son, but him to whom the Son will reveal it. I think we can take that as proof positive. Next thing that cropped up, well, no, sorry, I forgot this slide, I'll put it in. I want to jump forward on the Inspired Revision to tell you something else, because to me it's very important. It just goes to show you the nonsense that Joseph Smith made up as he went along. In 1844, King Follett, I don't know if you know, well, one or two of you might not, King Follett was an elder, he was, had a bucket of bricks fell on his head when they were building a well, and he died, and the family asked him to speak at the funeral, which was a big mistake, because he didn't do a, a eulogy for King Follett, we got all the crap about God. So this is a very famous sermon. And Smith says, God is an exalted man, and he sits enthroned in yonder heavens, and that's the great secret. This is 1844, don't forget. He was once a man like us, yea, he himself, the father of all, dwelt on earth. As man is, God once was, as God man may become. It's funny how Hinckley <laughs> said that uh, he doesn't know they teach it and doesn't know much about it. This is two prophets now, and yet Joseph Smith said, it's plain beyond disputation. So... I think he's not around to ask, but I don't know where he got that idea from, especially as when anybody gets their second, in, uh, their second endowment, the calling that's made sure in the temple, when they get promises like this, he's the one that authorised He knew what he was doing. He was just lying. So what does he go on to say? This is the important part because it, it refers to the inspired revision of the Bible in a moment. He takes as his text to prove plural gods and that God had a body, Revelation 1.6, and he takes it directly from the King James Version, which is a huge mistake because it's the, probably one of the only versions ever that made this error. The King James Version that the church uses today still has this in it. The normal modern King James Version doesn't. It's been updated, but the church sticks with the past because it's convenient. Have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him and glory and domination be forever and ever. Joseph Smith says, note the phrase God and his Father. He will say in a minute when I press the button hard enough. It is altogether correct in the translation. So in 1844, Joseph Smith is claiming that the King James Version is a correct translation in declaring that God has a Father. That's where he gets his theology from. Smith either forgot or, as usual, completely ignored the fact that earlier when he revised the Bible, he changed that because he knew in his monotheistic mode that, in fact, it was not true. And if you read the inspired revision, it reads, unto God his father. The word and disappears because he knew very well God couldn't have a father. And you know the irony? He was right because that verse is probably the only thing he ever got right because if you take a literal translation from the original Hebrew, it reads, kings and priests to his God and Father. Every single edition of the Bible, other than the King James Version, I think one, maybe two others that were at that time, made this mistranslation. None of the others did. Smith corrected it. But later on, he changed his theology, so he reverted to the King James he just did what he felt like doing and made it up as he went along. And you can't follow a prophet that isn't consistent. Lectures of Faith came next, 1834. Lecture 5, very specific about the Godhead, says quite clearly there are two personages. Oh, I thought there were three. Lots of bodies in here somewhere, governing supreme power of everything. They're the Father, and, the father being a personage of spirit, 1834. And the Son... Person was who was in the bosom of the Father, monotheism, a person is of ta tabernacle. And incidentally, nowhere in the virtues of faith is the Holy Spirit anything other than the mind of God. They're still traditional. Again, apologists say, oh, Joseph Smith didn't write this. Well, he taught them and he had people memorize it. And it, it stayed, they, they, they formed the doctrine part of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1835, stayed there till the 20th century. So, anyway, first vision. What evidence is there of there being a first vision before 1842? What evidence is there? Okay. 1828 to 1830, 1830, the Book of Mormon was written and published. Nothing about a first vision. Would have made a good preface or introduction or whatever you want to put. 1832, the first anti-Mormon book came out. Nothing about a first vision. 1832 to 34, the Evening and Morning Star, Church newspaper was, was published. No first vision was ever mentioned. Book of Commandments came out in 33. The biggest and greatest one ever wasn't included. 1834, Mormonism unfailed. Anti-Mormon book. First vision, not a mention. Nobody knew about it. 1834 to 35, Lectures of Faith were published, monotheistic throughout, God's an omnipresent spirit. The Latter-day Saints, Medjugorje and Advocate was published, another newspaper from the church, 34 to 36, no mention of a first vision ever. 1837, A Voice of Warning, Parley P. Pratt. This is a missionary pamphlet now. It's more of a book at 220-odd pages, but they call it a pamphlet. 
Um, voice of warning. It's got chapters on prophecies. It's boring. Don't bother to read it. Prophecies future. It's got a whole chapter on the origin of the American Indians. <laughs> the church would have a problem with that at the moment. Um, and then it's got, a, it's got a whole chapter on the, the restoration of the gospel. Does it include the mention of a first vision? No. Nah. 17 years after the event. Not a word in a missionary booklet. 39 to 46, times and seasons. And before the publication in 1842, nothing, nada, not a word. Same with the Millennial Star in England, before 1842, nothing. And in 1842, another anti-Mormon book, 22 years after the supposed first vision event, nothing. Who knew that the first vision existed before that? 1831, some of you will be familiar with the fact that Palmyra newspaper, The Reflector, ran three articles during the, the month of February, during 31. The first one... These show that Joseph Smith didn't claim to have any visions early on. It, however, appears quite certain the prophet himself never made any serious pretensions to religion until his pretended revelation of the discovery of the Book of Mormon. That's what they added in to show what it meant. So until after 1837, apparently nobody in the area knew Joseph Smith even thought about religion. Now this next one I want to be a little bit cautious about. I'm quoting it from Quinn because I, I don't want to disagree with another author. Um, but Quinn... Um, states this, but I don't agree with his summation. Let me just explain this. Forget the words they affirmed for a moment. In Quinn's note, he says in Origins, but by 1831, a Palmyra newspaper was reporting that Smith disclaimed he had seen God frequently and personally. And then he says, I wonder if this could be about the first vision. In my opinion, it is not, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's no evidence that anybody knew about it, for one thing, but he misses out the words they newspaper, it actually says, Smith, they affirmed, claimed he had seen God frequently and personally. Well, that was Oliver Cowdery and his mates telling the reporter, oh yes, yeah, Smith sees God all the time. Reporter tells the editor, editor publishes the line. But in that same newspaper, the editor also states, it will be borne in mind that no divine interposition had been dreamed of at the period. So it's perfectly clear that it has nothing to do with the first vision, with due respect to Quinn's question rather than statement. So I do like his work other than other than just wanted to clarify that. And two weeks later, they clarified even more by putting this in the newspaper. It's well known that Joe Smith never pretended to have any communication with angels until a long time after the pretended finding of his book. So nobody knew anything about a glorious, transcendent first vision during all those early years. There's nothing anywhere that supports the idea. How about Smith's mother? He must have told his mother, surely. No. Nah. She started her autobiography in 1845, the year after her son died. In it, she states quite clearly, it was the angel that appeared to Smith in his bedroom who told him there is not a true church on earth. No, not one. The original text doesn't mention a single word about any first vision whatsoever. If you read it today, it does. And why? Because when it was published in Liverpool by Orson Pratt, he inserted the account and a lot of other junk that Joseph Smith had published in the Times and Seasons without Lucy knowing, without her permission or her knowledge. She had no idea all her life that Joseph Smith was claiming he had a vision. No idea whatsoever. Now, this I have to make clear in a moment. This is an interview by Martin Harris with Tiffany's in 1859. And he's not referring to the first vision. He's referring to um, the fact that he was talking to the family about the plates. David Smith was trying to con him into selling part of his farm to support the publication of the Book of Mormon. So this is what Harris says happened when Smith was trying to get him to part with money. Joseph had before this described the manner of his finding the plates. He found them by looking at the stone in his hat, you know, that he found in the well of Mason Chase, the one he used for the money digging. And the family told me likewise the same thing. Joseph said the angel told him he must quit the money of the money, money, quit the money of the, read it yourself, <laughs> quit the company of the money diggers, uh, have no more to do with him. He shouldn't lie, swear, or steal. Well, an angel would say that, wouldn't he? You shouldn't lie, swear, or steal. It's typical make-it-up-as-you-go-along stuff. He told him to go and look in the spectacles, and he would show him the man that would assist him. That he did so. He saw myself, the gullible Martin Harris, standing there before him. <laughs> Poor Martin Harris. Now, you might wonder what that's got to do with the first vision. Well, nothing but everything. It's what he says next that struck my mind. He says, I had the account of it from Joseph his wife, his brothers, his sisters, his father and his mother, I talked with them separately that I might get to the truth of the matter. Ten individual interviews with ten individual members of the family and Smith's trying to con him out of his farm, telling him angels have told him where to find the place. Wouldn't you have thought that one of them would have said, oh, by the way, it all started with the glorious vision of God and Jesus in a... Not a not... What are the odds of it happening when nobody knew about it? So what were the first mentions ever of a glorious first vision? Well, I'll tell you. Well, you thought I would, didn't you? 
The first ever report of the first vision was by Orson Pratt in a booklet that he published in Edinburgh in 1840. It was called An Interesting Account of Remarkable, Vi- Remarkable Visions. And in it, he identifies a very short paragraph on the first vision, and it says two personages appeared. They remain, remain entirely unidentified. We don't know whether they're angels, whether it's God or Jesus, but he records the fact. Two years later, in the very same year that Joseph Smith published, Orson Hyde published one in German. And it was, pub- it was, re- it was translated back into English in 1969, but I had my wife go back to the original German because she did well in German at school, and I don't know what German is really. And we think it was called A Cry from the Wilderness, A Voice from the Dust of the Earth. We retranslated the passage. It's almost word for word in part of it, the same as Hyde's, Pratt's rather. And he says it was two glorious personages. I'm going to come back to Pratt in a moment because the church has something to say about that. And I'm going to deal with Orson Hyde first. Let's get him out of the way. Orson Hyde made his account in 42, two glorious personages. Now you've got to bear in mind that most people didn't know about the first vision even after 1842. If you weren't a local person that read the uh, newspaper, Times and Seasons, and if you didn't pick it up in other things that came out, it wasn't like in a, on everybody's bookshelf. It was in the dusty history of the church for years. In those days, the, the first principles of the gospel weren't what they are now. There were two things, the Book of Mormon and the Gathering. That was it. That's, that's what they sold. Anyway, Orson Hyde, what did he think? Well, years later, he said this. Someone may say, if this work of the last days be true, why didn't the Saviour come himself to communicate this intelligence to the world? Because to the angels was committed the power of reaping the earth, and it was committed to none else. So Hyde obviously thought the vision was of angels. It hadn't got through to everybody. So what does that leave us with? 1840. Hmm. Okay, this is a reference you're going to want. The church, or at least Brigham Young University, and as it's owned by the church, I hold them totally responsible, so if they don't like this, I'll have to tell BYU to take it down. <coughs> He's extracted some stuff from these two guys that appear on there. There's a, there's a whole thing about where it comes from. It's on the website. It's far too much to put on the page, but that's the link to the church website or BYU website. What the, what the BYU says is, regarding Orson Pratt's interesting account of remarkable visions, is that it ranks as one of the great Mormon books. It's actually a pamphlet, but they can call it a book if they like, as it contains the first printed account of Joseph Smith's 1820 vision. Yay! All my research, all those months, and they agree with me. So I got it right. It was the first account. I didn't find anything. I was scared somebody else would. You know, you stand up and you think, what if I'm wrong? (laughs) Only three manuscript accounts antedating remarkable visions exist in the LDS Church archives. Good, good, good. That's the 1832 version where Joseph Smith said he saw Jesus who forgave his sins and the two 1835 accounts where he saw angels and one of them testifies of Christ, so Christ wasn't there. We're up to speed. So what does it mean? Well, your minds are racing forward on this one, I should think. What does it mean? It means, they say, the church says, it reflects that Joseph Smith discussed this transcendent vision only privately with a few trusted friends during the first few years. I couldn't find one, not even his own mother. But that's not the point. Didn't Joseph Smith say something about being persecuted for telling everybody and their mother that he saw God and Jesus and some shit? <laughs> Does, the, Doesn't the header above verse 21, the most correct history ever written, say he was persecuted, heaped upon him? And doesn't Smith himself say he was persecuted, hated and persecuted for saying, I've seen a vision? Can you remember what he said in his story? He says more in the next few lines than he said about the vision itself. This is him getting the sympathy vote. Why the opposition and persecution that arose against me when I didn't tell anybody, almost in my infancy? Didn't he say that he met a Methodist minister a few days later and gave him a full account of the vision, and didn't the minister tell everybody, weren't they ganging up on him? He says, my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against me among the professors of religion, and was a cause of great persecution. I was 14 years old, and they continued to persecute me. (laughs) Bitter persecution, reviling, 14 years old. They were persecuting me, reviling me, and speaking all manner of evil against me. I suffered severe persecution at the hands of all men. And he then dates it for us. He says, specifically, between the time I had the vision, spring of 1820, and the year 1823, I was persecuted by people who ought to have been my friends. And the church is now conceding that Joseph Smith lied, 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 lied. What does that leave? Nothing. Absolutely nothing.